Let's take as an example the famous 4% rule. It says that each year you are allowed to sell 4% of your shares safely because the growth of the market will make up for that. However, ask any retiree that got into retirement with that 4% rule during a prolonged bear market and you will find out why this likely isn't a good idea. Here is the math behind it. Let's say you have $1 million in your portfolio. You are allowed to sell 4% of it, meaning $40,000. You have decided that this is enough for you to live and so you decide to retire. However, market drops by 30%. Now you have $700,000. If you want the same $40,000, you have to sell 5.71% of your portfolio instead of the 4%. Oops. And if by some chance we enter into a so-called lost X number of years period and you don't have cash flow, things get really ugly. This phrase is used for a set of time in which the stock market isn't going anywhere. You will sometimes hear it as a lost decade in the media, but it can be for any number of years. Here is a visualization of what that means. It's a chart of the S&P 500 index that supposedly always goes up and is inflation adjusted. Now, granted, it does go up over time, but check this out. 30 years, then 24 years, then 15 years of lost periods. Will your retirement start being such a period? No one knows. It's a gamble. It's a gamble with your life. Can you afford that? Imagine what this famous 4% rule will do to your portfolio in such periods. You will get wrecked. Now, with the next story, I want to discuss the idea that you can sell part of your investments in order to fund your lifestyle. And also, I will touch on the topic of companies distributing dividends because they have no better use for that capital. We already went through the potential pitfalls of strategies like the 4% rule that require you to constantly sell shares and what happens in a bear market or a lost decade. Now, I will show you the practical reasons why that might not be such a good idea. I will tell you about two friends, Richard and Jack. They went to university together and right after they graduated, they decided to start their own tech startup. Richard and Jack did very well and when they turned 30, they decided to sell it. They managed to exit for $8 million, splitting the money 50-50. So, now each of them has $4 million. Richard decides that he doesn't want to risk his principal and he is not a fan of constantly monitoring share prices, so he decides to invest in four dividend-paying companies. Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, PepsiCo, and Realty Income. He manages to make $130,000 a year in dividends and adjusts his lifestyle to live pretty comfortably with that amount. He knows that the payout ratios and the business models of these companies are rock solid and that the management has proven it can manage the investor's capital in their best interest. Jack, on the other hand, is a growth investor at heart and he wants to invest in rapidly growing companies in newer industries that will multiply his capital through the coming decades. He puts $4 million in Tesla, Google, Amazon, and Meta. Now, disclaimer, these are just examples of companies that are huge businesses and are not paying any dividends. At the time of watching this, this might have changed, but you can substitute any company with a company X that doesn't distribute cash to its shareholders. Now, back to Jack. Since he wanted to retire after his big exit, he decides to follow the 4% rule and will sell $160,000 worth of shares every year to fund his life, allowing himself to live even more comfortably than Richard. Now, let's analyze the situation of Richard and Jack. Who do you think can retire more comfortably? Who can spend the next decades knowing that he has X amount of money to spend every month? For Richard, it's pretty clear. Not so much for Jack. What if, in order to get his $160,000, he has to sell 6% of his shares for five straight years? What would that do to him emotionally? Watching his hard-earned capital that he hoped would last his entire life diminishing at a faster pace than planned? Or maybe he keeps the 4% rule, so now he needs to scale back his lifestyle. Or perhaps he decides that one of the companies is a bit overvalued and sells part of the investment to buy a new car. Is he right? Is he wrong? The moral of the story is this. 
when you identify companies and funds of great quality, you can comfortably let the management decide how much money they need to run and grow the business and how much they can afford to pay you. How do you do that with a company that doesn't pay you anything? Can you really say you know that Netflix is overvalued so that you can sell it right now and go on a vacation? And isn't it better to let the management of Johnson & Johnson decide that through their dividend? The point is, with dividend investing, you literally let the best management teams in the whole world decide how much you are allowed to spend without ruining your investment. With the growth investing strategy, you have to constantly decide that for yourself. Now, I don't want to underestimate you, but I guess probably 99.9% .9 of the people watching this video won't do a better job in that than the management of the largest pharmaceutical or consumer products companies in the world that literally manage capital for a living at a world-class level. Talking about retiring, right now, some of you are thinking, but hey, I will just use my growth investments to grow my capital and then I will rotate into cash flowing ones. E yeah, I'm not so sure about that. That rarely works in practice. Do you really think you will invest with one strategy, research, think a certain way for 30 years and then once you are 55, you are suddenly going to switch everything, sell everything and plunge into a whole new strategy with all the wealth you have worked for for the past 30 years? Yeah, right. Very unlikely. It's good to fantasize about ideal scenarios. It's another thing to actually apply them in real life. Again, it's not impossible, but it is just really risky and difficult. You have to learn a whole new skill set and change entirely the way your brain looks at investments. Also, the transition can be quite dangerous. What if just after you buy, a huge bear market comes and prices tumble. Do you lower cost average? Do you buy at once? Or what if the bull market in your chosen growth companies continue? Do you now regret selling early? As you can see, it can be quite a messy and difficult to execute process.